morning. It's good to see you guys here. Glad you could make it today. Uh, we are in the fourth week of our series called Rise Above It. And like we said way back in the first week, the whole reason we're doing this series is because what we all know is that what we do are inclinations, our tendencies, our habits, our habitual attitudes, the things that we do over and over again over time ultimately determine who we become. That the choices that we make, the habits that we develop, the attitudes that we just tend to have over time, they ultimately determine who we become. And we know this, we just get this because we've seen this play out in our lives. And here's what we also know is that we know that this isn't all there is to it. This isn't the only input into the equation because we know that there was a time when the what that we were doing wasn't causing us to become the who that we wanted to become. And so we decided to change the what because we didn't like the who that the what was causing us to become. So we tried to change the what and what we found out was that the what wasn't all that easy to change. That habit we tried to stop, that attitude that we tried to change, that thing that we tried to undo that we'd been doing for so long just didn't change that easily. And it was as if, it was as if there was more to the equation than just what and who. It was like there was something that preceded the what, that as long as we were attacking the what, we couldn't quite get to the root or the symptom of the problem. What we mentioned way back in the first week was that what we believe produces the what and ultimately produces the who is our perspective. And we know this because we've seen this play out in our lives too, because there was that time when you had to be somewhere and it was really critical that you had to be there on time because uh, you were given that ultimatum of if you're late one more time, this is what's going to happen, or it was that important meeting that you had to get to, or it was that kid's thing that you told them that you would definitely be there on time for that you had to get to. And then you got on the road and you hit that unexpected traffic and that sinking feeling that you had in your stomach of, oh my goodness, I am not going to get there on time. And you were already thinking of all the fallout and your hands started to sweat and your heart started to race and your mind started to panic as you were trying to think through like, how am I going to work around this and how am I going to explain this? Now, if we take that situation and you elevate, I don't know, 250 feet up and you see that over the crest of the hill, all the traffic clears up. The, the wreck is already moved to the side of the road. Cars are already flowing. And you know that you're going to get there with time to spare. Now, put yourself back down into the exact same situation, the exact same scenario. And how do we feel now? Calm. Relaxed. Heart's at a regular level. Mind's not panicking. We're not freaking out anymore, Right? What changed? We're in the exact same situation, the exact same scenario, the exact same things going on. The only thing that changed is our perspective. And that's the power of perspective. The perspective has the power to change our physiology. It has the power to change our emotions. It has the power to change our attitude. It has the power to change our actions, our behaviors. It has the power to change our values. All of it derives from perspective. And that's why throughout Jesus' teachings and throughout the New Testament, we find over and over again that Jesus doesn't say that we're bad people that need to learn how to be good. He says we're people with the wrong perspective that need the right perspective. People have a, 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 a misunderstanding of how reality works. It needs to, we need to have a more accurate perspective of how reality and life works. For people who are in darkness who need light, for people who've been deceived that need truth, for people with misunderstanding that need a renewed understanding, that we need renewed perspective. And the Apostle Paul understood this. The Apostle Paul, who had persecuted Christians and then became a follower of Jesus because he'd encountered the resurrected Jesus, and because he saw that if Jesus could predict and pull off his own death and resurrection, then maybe he could also resurrect him from the death as well, from death as well. And Paul became a follower of Jesus because he believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Paul, writing to a group of followers of Jesus in a place called Colossae, told him, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Focus your mind on things above, not on earthly things, because Paul understood the significance of perspective. And he'd seen firsthand in the resurrected Christ, this eternal perspective. And he knew, he knew that if people could wrap their minds around life from eternal perspective, they could rise above their circumstances, that perspective would have the power to change human lives. Because as our perspective goes, so we go. 
And so this whole series, this whole series, we've been talking about different attitudes, different tendencies, different inclinations that all of us have. All of us have these, these, these times where we just tend to slide towards certain perspectives, certain attitudes, certain behaviors, and it's all derived from perspective. And so the one that we're going to dive into today, I want to introduce by encouraging you to complete this state statement for yourself. I will be happy when blank. I will be happy when blank. And by happy, I don't mean like jumping up and down, like you just won the lottery, happy, like I'm so glad that this finally happened. By happy, I mean that, that happy that we mean when we say things like, I just want to be happy. Or when you look to your spouse and it's like, why can't we just be happy? Or when you look back at another time in your life and say, I can remember when I used to be happy. That's the kind of happiness we're talking about. So with that in mind, how would you complete the statement, I will be happy when blank? And what goes in your blank? I mean, for some of you, for some of you, it might be something job related. Like I will be happy when I don't have to work at this job anymore. When I finally get that promotion and I can move out of this place and I can go work at somewhere else. Or maybe for some of you who are students, it's like, I will be happy when I no longer have any more papers to write or exams to study for. And maybe some of you, I will be happy when I finally find that person that I can marry. And for some of you, I will be happy when that person that I married ends up being the person that I meant to marry and they start or they stop. Or I will be happy when my finances are finally in a place where I can do X, Y, or Z. I will be happy when blank. This, this doesn't mean that you, that, that you go around life just upset all the time and miserable all the time and grumpy all the time. And it doesn't mean that there aren't things that you're glad for or happy for. It doesn't mean that there aren't high points in your life. It just means that along with all of that, you just kind of have this gnawing sense of, I'm not as happy as I could be. I'm not completely happy. There's this satisfaction level that I'm not experiencing yet, and I'm not going to experience it until blank. And I think whatever, whatever goes in the blank for you probably represents some kind of tension, some kind of conflict, some kind of difficulty in your life, whether it's relational or it's job related or it's family related or it's financially related, that it represents some kind of challenge or difficulty or struggle that you have in your life. And whatever goes in your blank, here's what I think. I think all of us, all of us tend to see that thing that goes in the blank as a roadblock to our happiness. There's a sense of as long as that thing exists, as long as that thing's there, as long as it's looming, as long as it's playing out, I can't be happy. And here's what we have to confront, is that, as, that, that if we continue to have that attitude, if we continue to have that attitude, and we continue to have something in that blank, which we will, for your whole life long, you will always, always, always be able to put something in that blank, whether it's I'll be happy when I finish school or I find that person or that person becomes the person that I meant for them to be or I finally get that job or I finally get my finances. There's always going to be something that can go in that blank. As long as there's something that can go in that blank, and there always will be, and as long as you have that attitude that that thing is the roadblock to your happiness, you will never, never, never be happy. And the solution, the solution isn't just to ignore our challenges or ignore our struggles or ignore our tensions and just choose to be happy anyway, because that doesn't work. We know that doesn't work because we tried it and it didn't work. The thing's still there and we're not happy about it. The solution isn't a what solution. And it's not that we just need to do something different. The solution isn't a what solution because the problem isn't a what problem. It's a perspective problem. And what we need is a new perspective. And the really cool thing is that 2,000 years ago, we got a new perspective. That's still a new perspective for a lot of us today. It's just one of those things that we always need to be reminded of. And this new perspective comes from a person named James who wrote a letter that was aptly named after him that we find in the New Testament portion of our Bibles. James was the half-brother of Jesus. And James, during the life of Jesus, while he was ministering on earth, completely denied Jesus, thought Jesus was a little bit cuckoo and out of his mind for claiming the things that he was claiming. James had really no interest in following or being aligned with Jesus in any way. But then after, after his big half-brother died, after his big half-brother died, became a follower of Jesus. Now, let me ask you, what would it take for your older brother to convince you 
that he was the son of God and was worth worshiping? What would it take? What would your big brother have to do to convince you of that? Right? Would it take anything less than your older brother predicting and single-handedly pulling off his death and subsequent resurrection? Right? Would it take anything less than that for you to be convinced that your older brother is the son of God? Well... That's the only thing that can explain what happened in the life of James. James went from not being convinced of Jesus and who he claimed to be to becoming a follower of Jesus. And then he writes, he he becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem shortly thereafter. And he writes this letter that we're going to be looking at this morning. He writes this letter to uh, Jewish Christians who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And the reason the Jewish Christians were scattered throughout the Roman Empire at this point was because in just weeks after Jesus' death and resurrection, people, tons of people, just mobs of people were becoming followers of Jesus because just weeks ago, just days ago, those people had been in the city and seen Jesus claim to be the son of God, had seen him killed and then seen him come back To life, And they started telling all their friends, not about something that they heard, but something that they saw. Not years ago, but just days ago. And the Jesus movement started growing faster and faster. And how could it not? Because a man had just claimed to be God, had just been killed, and then come back to life. And it happened in their midst. And the movement started growing. And the and the religious leaders that were in Jerusalem at that time, the Jewish religious leaders, started to get really nervous because they saw it as a threat to their authority and the things that they were trying to accomplish. And so they sanctioned persecution against Christians in just the weeks after Jesus' death and resurrection. So they started persecuting them. And the Jewish Christians who were in Jerusalem at that time had the choice, stay and possibly be killed, or be imprisoned, or flee for their lives. And the vast majority of them chose to flee and and were spread throughout the Roman Empire. And so these people, when James writes this letter two decades later, these people are now scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They've left their homes, they've left their possessions, they're living in places where they have no ancestral roots, no support. Many of them have lost family members, husbands, fathers, brothers, sisters, many of whom have been killed. Many more have been put in prison and are being unjustly imprisoned. And now they're living in these foreign cities, just trying to scrape by, just trying to survive. And we can imagine that these people, when they received this letter, were probably, probably in a place where they were wondering, can we ever be happy again? And in the midst of that, in the midst of that place, where all of us have been at some point or another, James writes this letter. And it's as much to them at that time as it is to us today. And he says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Consider it pure joy. And if we'd been there 2,000 years ago and we got this letter, we probably would have thought, this is great because we're going to get something that we can be happy about. Because right now there's really not a lot that we can be happy about. And James is writing us this letter from Jerusalem. And maybe, just maybe, the thing that we can be happy about is that the persecution is over and we can finally go home. And so there's hope. James has given us hope, something to be joyful about. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever, whenever you face trials of many kinds, to which they must have thought, do you even understand? Do you even realize? Do you not know that we have lost family members? Do you not know that we have husbands and fathers that we will never see Again, do you not understand that we have family members who are being unjustly imprisoned right now? Do you not understand that every day is just a struggle to survive? You're going to tell us to be joyful? Like, what kind of pat answer is that? James goes on. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know, that's what he's going to say. I'm telling you, because you know that the testing of your faith 
And he refers to their trials as testing of their faith. He uses it interchangeably. He's saying these trials that you're going through, it's a testing of your faith. And not their faith as in like their belief in the existence of God or that, you know, there are certain facts that you have to agree to about God. But he's talking about the testing of your faith. Faith being, do you still believe that God is good? And are you in the midst of your struggles and your trials still willing to trust him? And trust that he wants your best. The testing of your faith. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. To which they must have thought, the last thing that we need is perseverance. We have no interest in perseverance. What we want are our fathers back. What we want are our wives back. What we want are our homes back. What we want is our land back. 20 years ago, we weren't wandering out around looking for perseverance. We have no interest in perseverance. We just want to be happy. We just want our lives back. James says, well, that's, that's not the end of it. He continues. He says, perseverance, it's not an end in itself. It's not perseverance for the sake of perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work. Perseverance, as you push through the struggles and continue to trust that God is good and that he wants your best, is accomplishing something in you. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And here we find James echoing something that we find throughout the entirety of Scripture, throughout the Old Testament and through Jesus' teachings and throughout the New Testament. James is echoing the fact that every single one of us that's been created in the image of God that we were meant to be loving the way that God is loving, generous the way that God is generous, patient like God is patient, humble, kind, forgiving, graceful the way that God is. But we find ourselves living in a reality, separated from the presence of God, without an understanding of who he intended us to be, who he created us to be, and we're just trying to figure it out. We're just trying to get by. We're just trying to survive. And along the way, the image of God that we were created in, it, just, it gets a little bit tarnished. It just gets a little bit tilted and, and messed up. And then God came in flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to show us, this is how I created you to live. This is who I created you to be. And then dies on a cross to show that if I'm willing to die for you, then I am for you. Will you trust me? Will you trust me and become my follower and mimic, mimic, replicate the life that I have demonstrated for you, the life that I created for you to live? Because when you do, when you do, you become conformed to the person that I created you to be. That following Jesus reforms us, conforms us to the person that he created us to be and to the image of God and allows us to do the things that he created us to do and to experience the life that he created us to to live. And the premier context in which God does that, the premier context in which God molds us and shapes us and develops us, the premier context that we see throughout all of human history, that we see throughout the Old Testament, that we see throughout the New Testament, that you've seen in your life, and that I've seen in mine, the premier context is in our greatest struggles and challenges and difficulties. That God uses our challenges our struggles and that tension to grow us and to develop us as we trust him and follow him in faith. He uses those situations to grow and develop us so that those things that we see as a boundary or a roadblock to our happiness are actually, actually paths to our potential. And we know this. Regardless of what you believe or whether you believe in God or what you believe about God, we all know this because we can all look back over our lives and we know that the times when we grew the most, the times when we got the most potent understanding of who we are, when we got the biggest breakthroughs in understanding how relationships are supposed to work, when we saw our patients grow exponentially, when we saw ourselves develop new capacities that we never knew that we could have, were times when we were faced with the biggest struggles and challenges of our lives. And when you and when I look back over our lives, the things that shaped us most become the people that we are today. The things that pop to the forefront are always, always our biggest struggles and challenges because those are the places where we grow the most. And James is saying, this isn't an accident. 
This isn't just a coincidence. It's because that's how God designed life to work. God looked at how could I take free-willed human beings who can make their own choices, and how do I develop them into the people that I created them to be? And it doesn't mean that God causes or inflicts our circumstances upon us, but God knows how to leverage our circumstances to, to transform us into the people that he created us to be. So when we go through those situations that require so much patience, so much more patience than you actually have right now, it requires us to grow and stretch and we develop new levels of patience. We go through situations that require us to be generous beyond what we ever would have thought made any sense. It's because God is growing generosity in us. Or you go through that relationship where that other person demands so much forgiveness. There's so much that they need to be forgiven for. So much grace that they need that it stretches you and extends you beyond what you were before. It's necessary for you to become grace-filled the way that God is, the way that he designed you to be. So you can experience the life that he created you to experience. So you can look at those things and say, that's not, that's not a roadblock to my happiness. That's the path to my potential. I think it's what we need to be reminded of regularly. And I think what a lot of us need to be reminded of this morning is we need to cherish the challenge. Cherish the challenge. It's a good tagline, and I stole it from somebody. I did not originate that. I stole it from a good friend of mine named Ryan Morse. Ryan Morse is the founding owner of Crucible Performance, which is a gym here in Frederick that is focused on changing athletes from the inside out as they adopt the cherish the challenge mentality. I'll take my $5 after service, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I, 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 that, that tagline, I was familiar with it before, and as I was developing the message, I was like, that fits so well. I want to use that. So I went to Ryan and said, can I steal that from you? He said, of course. And he said, do you know where I got that from? I said, I don't even made it up. He said, well, he said, when, when I was starting the gym, it was, it was kind of a time when I was just kind of starting into life. You know, we were kind of newly married. And he said, just starting the business was really, really difficult. It was just roadblock after roadblock and challenge after challenge of finding a place and getting the approvals and having everything in place. He said, it was just a big challenge. And he said, during that time, he kept going back to that passage that we just read from James 1, 2 to 4, where he just kept reminding himself to consider it pure joy whenever he faced trials of many kinds. He just kept going back to that. And he said it was during that time in his life where he realized the parallel between how athletes develop physically and how God designed life to work for us to develop character wise and spiritually and emotionally and all the other ways that human beings develop. And he recognized that for, for athletes to get better, they have to be put through situations and then have tension added and, and times added and harder and harder requirements added so they can grow and develop past the plateaus that they hit that continually need to be stretched. And he said, I realized during that time in my life that it's the same way with us. God does the exact same thing with us. He puts us in situations that are a little bit beyond what we could have handled before. But it stretches us, it challenges us, and it grows us in ways that we couldn't have grown before. And so when he, when he realized that, it was just kind of like this, this light bulb went off. That if this is the way that life works, and if this is the necessary path for me to become the person that God created me to be and experience life the way God created me to experience it, if this is the necessary path, then I might as well cherish it. I might as well enjoy it if this is the way for me to get to where I need to go. That I might as well walk up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe and grab by the lapel and look in the eye my challenges and say, I'm going to cherish the challenge. I'm going to cherish the challenge because I'm not going to let my circumstances dictate my happiness. I'm going to cherish the challenge because I'm not going to let my circumstances defer my happiness. I'm going to cherish the challenge because I know this is going to make me better. This is going to make me stronger. I'm going to cherish the challenge because I know on the other side of this, I'm going to be a better husband, and I'm going to be a better mother, and I'm going to be a better employee, and I'm going to be a better employer, that I'm going to cherish the challenge because I know on the other side of this, God is going to be able to use me to build his kingdom in ways that he couldn't have used me before. And so I'm going to cherish the challenge, and I'm going to look at my challenges. I'm going to say, that's not a roadblock to my happiness. 
That's the path to my potential. That relationship is not a roadblock to my happiness. It's the path to my potential. That job position isn't a roadblock to my happiness. It's the path to my potential. This season of life isn't a roadblock to my potential. It's the path to my potential. So I'm going to cherish the challenge. And I think some of us this morning desperately need that reminder Because we've let that challenge, we've let that tension, we've let that relationship just grind us down and grind us down. And we just keep thinking, I'll be happy when this is over. I'll be happy when. And we keep deferring our happiness and putting it off. And you're going to wish your life away. And you're going to miss out on the things that God wants to do right in the midst of your challenges, right where you are. Some of us, some of us need to be reminded to cherish the challenge. Some of us need to be reminded that we need to persevere in the pressure. That under the pressure, we need to continue to persevere. And I I love that that Ryan's gym is named Crucible. Because if you're not familiar with Crucible, it's just like the perfect parallel for this passage in Scripture. The the, the Crucible was developed thousands and thousands of years ago when human beings discovered how to get iron out of the earth and they mixed it together with carbon and created something called steel and they realized that steel is really good for molding into different shapes that's helpful for killing people and so they developed steel into swords and spearheads and things like that but what they found was that straight out of the earth iron is filled with impurities and when you make it into steel it's steel that's filled with impurities and all those impurities create these pockets of weakness and the weapons that they would develop so when they were taken into combat these weapons were really brittle and they would break under the pressures of combat until some very wise lady or gentleman came up with this idea of the crucible. And the crucible was like this enclosed furnace in which you put steel and you superheat it until it becomes molten. And you keep it in there and you keep adding heat and keep adding heat and keep adding heat and the impurities will rise to the surface. And they skim them off and heat it and heat it, heat it as more impurities rise and skim those off. And they keep it in there and keep the heat going because it was necessary for removing the impurities and once they were all removed they would have crucible steel without impurities without weakness and when forces took that into combat against forces that didn't have crucible feel they were always victorious because under the pressures and rigors of combat they would never break this is the perfect illustration of what god does in your life and in mine he doesn't cause the circumstances but he allows us to experience the circumstances. And his call, his call to us is to remain faithful, not to try to get out of it, not to run from it, not to hide from it, but to stay right there in it because God will do something in us. And there are exceptions to this. There are people in domestic violence situations and God does not intend that for you. And I don't care what anybody says, that is not God's intention for you. And there are local resources available through Hartley House as well as others. And it doesn't doesn't apply to people who are in human trafficking situations or anything else where where somebody's being abused or hurt. That is not God's intention for anybody. So we're going to take all those things and just set them over here. But all those other things, the marriages that you feel trapped in, the job that you feel stuck in, the relationships that are just causing so much heartache, those are contexts or God saying, don't run away from this. I know your marriage feels loveless. I know it's toxic. I know how much it breaks your heart, but I'm going to grow something in you right here. I'm going to grow some patience and some grace in you right here. Don't try to back out of it because I have an important work for you to do here. And the job that you have, the job that you just want to run from or move away from or get away from, take anything else, God saying, no. I want you to stay right here. Because there are things in you, there, there, there are character things in you that have developed over time that if they stay there, if they stay there, I'm not going to be able to use you in the way that I designed to use you. I'm not going to be able to use you to the effect that I intended to use you. So stay right there because there's something I'm going to remove from you so I can use you for this so you can experience this life that you wouldn't otherwise experience. And some of us, we just need to persevere. And some of us, I think, just need to be reminded that in the midst of all of it, God is still good. 
because I think there are probably some of us here that that this answer that God is going to take these situations and he's going to bring good out of it. It just seems too simple and clean cut. It just seems like a pat answer to real struggle and difficulties and tragedy. And for some of you, that's probably why you walked away from the church at some point. You went through some kind of tragedy and you turned to the church for answer and you felt all you got was this superficial response of, well, God's just going to use good out of that. And it didn't help you. And you walked away. And maybe some of you are sitting here this morning thinking about walking away from the whole thing because you didn't know how much tragedy was going to shake you. You didn't know the damage it was going to do to what you felt was foundational to your trust in God. And right here, right now, you're thinking, I don't know if I can go on. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I've seen. I've seen person after person after person who've gone through heartache and tragedy. I've watched spouses, watch wives and husbands die in hospital rooms. I've seen parents outlive their children. I've seen children have to say goodbye to their parents. I've watched parents watch their children struggle through addiction. I've seen people who've lost everything. And I see these things and from the outside looking in, To me, I think, I don't know how someone could survive that. I don't know how they continue to function. I don't know how they're staying healthy through this. And time and time again, as I watch people walk through these situations, I hear the the stories that come out of it. And they'll say, I never would have chosen that. I would never ask to go through it again. And I would never wish it on anybody. But I learned something through that there is no way I could have otherwise known that I walked through this and God walked with me and now I know that he is enough and he's good. He's enough for me. And the people that have gone through that, they know something about God that I can only know theoretically. They've had an experience, an encounter with God that I can only know by theory. And they've understood God experientially in a personal way that I can only know through theory, but they know it personally. And they've drawn close to God and they know his presence and they know his power and they know his goodness. And they know that even at the worst of life, that thing that we call happiness, where we just say, I just wish I could be happy. They know, they know that the answer, that the only thing, as their heavenly father. And I think we often assume that a good God would never allow suffering. And then when we see suffering or experience suffering, we ask, how could a good God allow this? But what if we believe that God was good? What if his proof on the cross was enough for us to believe that he's good? And in believing that God was good, instead asked, what would it take for a good God to allow us to go through this? What would it take for a good God who loves us with a love that we can only imagine, what would it take for him to allow his children to go through this kind of suffering? And could it be, could it be that your heavenly father who loves you unconditionally, who sees every pain and heartache you've gone through, your heavenly father who's seen every tear you've ever shed, your heavenly father whose heart breaks when yours breaks, that your heavenly father looks in the scales and looks at his desire for you to never suffer and his desire to never be without you. And this one wins every time because he knows, because he knows that of all the things that we think will make us happy, all the things that will bring us satisfaction, all the things that will bring us contentment, he knows that the only thing that will truly satisfy us is his relationship and our relationship with him. And he will do anything. He will pull out all the stops and use every tool in his toolbox for us to know that too. And if you took this perspective, if we took this perspective, if we reminded ourselves that in all of our situations and all of our struggles and all of our conflict and all of the tragedy, if we recognized 
this isn't just random chaos without meaning or something to be to, to run from or something to abandon God over, but if we recognize that this is something that our Heavenly Father will walk with us through, that there is something that God wants to develop in us through this, I think, I think we will know how to be happy because I believe I will be happy, you will be happy, that we will be happy when we draw close to our Heavenly Father. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much that in all of our trials and tragedies and heartache, you never leave us. You never walk away. You never abandon us. Regardless of the doubt that we go through, regardless of how much we question you, you never turn away from us. And you promise to walk through it with us. And you promise to give us a deeper understanding of you and your love for us. And Father, I know that there are hearts here today that just need to be healed by your presence and by your love. And how I pray for your spirit, Father, to whisper to us in these moments, to whisper to us in these minds and remind us that you are still good. That we can trust you. That you will take the smallest amount of faith and work it out for good. If not in this life, then eternity. You proved it on the cross. And you invite us in these circumstances to trust you. You are still good. We ask the strengthening of your spirit to help us with this. In Jesus' name.